Hey, Care Partners, Teresa Youngstrom. You know, I've had my business since 2018. I can't even believe it's been that long. But I can tell you that um, over the years, I keep my eyes and ears wide open to great organizations that are contributing in such an amazing way to the group of folks that I, I serve and, you know, people with different dementias and different brain changes. And I came across one of those wonderful organizations. And today I'm going to share with you the Giving Voice Foundation. And I have on with me their program director, Kristen Cooley. Let me tell you about Kristen. She's a clinical social worker who serves as the program director for the Giving Voice Foundation. In her program director role, she is providing leadership as well as strategic direction for planning, implementation, and growth of local programming for caregivers and persons affected by dementia, something I love about this organization. She has more than 15 years of experience working with individuals with chronic and or terminal illnesses along with their care partners in both inpatient and outpatient settings. Her professional journey includes six plus years at the Alzheimer's Association, when I think I first met her, um, where her eyes were really open to the uniquely difficult challenges a dementia diagnosis can bring to an individual and to their loved ones. Over the years, Kristen has facilitated numerous caregiver support groups, provided outpatient counseling services, and offered dementia education seminars in professional development settings as well as to the general community. Kristen's areas of specialty include, but are not limited to, caregiver and or older adults, specifically impacted by Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, as well as grief work, loss of independence, role transitions, isolation, anticipatory loss, and loss to death, all amazing topics. Kristen obtained her undergraduate degree in psychology from Indiana University and her Master of Social Work from University of Illinois. Clients and community partners can expect Kristen to be friendly, engaging, and striving to create a strong therapeutic bond of trust. And I can affirm that. Please help me welcome Kristen Cooley. Hey, welcome. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Finally get you on the podcast. It's so wonderful. You know, I've been watching the Giving Voice Foundation and watching it grow. And then I saw you were promoted to the program director and we had to make the call. I'm like, I have got to talk more about this organization. So congratulations and welcome. Well, thank you so much. And I knew it was such an important podcast that I invited Taylor Swift to oh. join me, right? So, <laughs> oh my gosh, I was telling you offline and to any watching, my daughter just had a birthday party, so you get to see the remnants of, of that as well. Some real yeah. life happening over here. What an amazing mom for that eight-year-old, and that's special. So we'll, we'll let Taylor join us. That's fine. You know, she's amazing. Well, let me get started with some questions because we never, we always run out of time. And so... What is the mission of the Giving Voice Foundation? Start there. Yes. So, you know, in a nutshell, the Giving Voice Foundation, it's a very small local based here in Cincinnati, local nonprofit that's really grassroots. And the the overall mission is is connection ultimately. So, so much of what the Giving Voice Foundation does is offer different programs and services that all kind of fold in creativity with the goal of connecting, bringing purpose and joy still amidst the disease process. Right. Well, what programs and services does the Giving Voice Foundation offer? Okay. So what, oh my gosh, where do I begin? So, I know because every time I'm turned around, they're advertising something else and it's so incredible and everything I've gone to has been incredible. No, well, thank you for yeah. that. So I would say probably the first step for a lot of families is what we call a purposeful planning program. And this is thankfully because of the fundraising events that the Giving Voice Foundation does in addition to lots of grants that we apply for. This is a program that's offered for free and it's myself and there's two other social workers and we offer these free consultations to families at any 
any stage in the disease process. And it's really an opportunity to dive in deeper to dementia education. So, you know, a lot of what we do, you do on these podcasts. So, you know, diving into what symptoms are typical, what's not as expected, um, how do we change the way we communicate with our loved one, what resources are out there, and how do we tap into those? When do we tap into those? So kind of creating a care plan and diving into disease knowledge. Um, So a lot of times that's kind of first step is meeting with people there. Like I said, it can be anyone that's maybe even just starting to show signs themselves and they want to come find out where do I go to get further testing or is this normal aging all the way to people that just got a diagnosis and are processing what that means to come all the way to people that maybe the person with the diagnosis isn't a part of the meeting anymore because Mm -hmm. they're having challenging behaviors Mm -hmm. or concerning symptoms. And we're really looking at what are the next steps in terms of care planning. So really kind of there is a resource for any any step of the process. And a lot of times then that's our, that's our first step to then connect them to other resources out in the community, Mm -hmm. some of which are giving voice. Mm -hmm. That is definitely more of our clinical program, I would say. Um, From there, it's much more creative. So we have a weekly program called Creative Connections. Um, and that is incorporating, there's kind of two parts to the program. There's a uh, music and movement part mm-hmm. for individuals with a dementia diagnosis. So usually somewhere between 20 to 30 people and there's a local musician or movement, um, excuse me, musician or music therapist, and then a movement instructor. So it could be a yoga instructor, or an occupational therapist or Tai Chi instructor, or dancer. And they're kind of weaving in and out of music and movement for 90 minutes. And while that's going on, the other part of the program is there's a caregiver support group that goes on simultaneously. And those are led by local professionals. So local social workers or other community partners out in in the community doing, doing this dementia work. So, you know, my my passion, my mission of being the program director is making sure that we're offering quality programming. So this is this is their expertise, right? There's not volunteers doing this. It's truly this is their craft, right? This is right. their battle right. cry, um, and so that's a wonderful way for people to kind of build their village, right? Mm. And um, Oh my gosh, I feel like we could spend this whole podcast talking about all the different, all the I different- know, I know. And I just have to say that I attended one of those and was so impressed with how comfortable it was for everyone coming. Um, there was food and there was the music and the, the dance, there was a dance part. And the cool thing was you couldn't really tell who in the audience had the diagnosis and who didn't. And that was really cool for how I feel like for helping individuals feel like, um, Oh, this is something that a nursing home puts on. No, it wasn't. It, it's something that you would feel normal going to. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. I would say like our target folks for any of these community programs like Creative Connection mm-hmm. or, um, you know, we have a ballroom dancing program called yes. Dance to Remember. We have a floral arranging program called Brains in Bloom. But I think you're right. The point that you brought up is, you know, there's not a big banner when you walk in that says, mm-hmm. this is for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Right. So it, you know, if people ask, what is this? What am I doing here? Mm-hmm. What's program it's not like well hi we're the giving voice foundation we support people with dementia no it's yeah. just we say oh this is you know an awesome program for people that are interested in music right right and it's a great stepping stone for families that aren't at a place where they're ready for facility placement right. or may never want that and so it's really kind of the stepping stone for folks to be able to get connected and find some engagement um and really could build their community outside of just right. within the home. Right? I think that's, you, you hit the nail on the head. Building community is so important that these individuals know you're not, you can't go this alone. It'll take you down. 
you can't go this alone. And I always, even in counseling families, it's like, look, it's great if you want to keep him or her at home. That's awesome. But eventually you will have to bring in help or it can take you down. So yeah, building community, especially if we can get them to you early enough where they're starting to see other people and, you know, that, you know, going through something with another person, with another family, that changes everything. I think then feeling so isolated. You're so right. And there's something, it's interesting. When we first started creating these programs, we thought like, okay, do we need to have it be stage specific? Like mm -hmm. only for early stage, only for mid stage. And what, what we learned that there's actually some beauty in the mixture too. Yes. You would think for someone that's earlier on that they would be scared to walk in and see folks that are further progressed. Mm -hmm. And some of the best compliments we've ever gotten was a guy who's very early stage and he came for the very first time mm -hmm. and he saw another woman who was further progressed and other people, other participants, not just, you know, the facilitators or volunteers, but other participants holding her hand, wrapping their arm around her, singing with her. He came up to us afterwards and he said, you know, I thought I was going to be scared, but it actually made me feel better watching them interact with her and seeing how good they were to her. Right. I've also had other folks say it gives them purpose for the folks that are earlier. Amen. They feel good, like they're helping out too. So yes. it really, and there's no judgment, right? Mm -hmm. If someone over here is flapping their arms like a bird mm -hmm. while everyone else is marching in place, no one cares. We all just start flapping right. our arms like a bird too. Right, right exactly. So, yeah. yeah. How can we bring them joy? You know, just because maybe I lose my cognition doesn't mean that I can't experience fun, you know, or beauty or nature and, you know, that camaraderie. So yeah, we could, we could go on and on just on that topic. Ooh, let me, yes. I know, let me pick your brain though, because you have so much knowledge in this area. So what emotions can caregivers expect to experience while caring mm -hmm. for a loved one with dementia? We need to go there and share that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What, um, uh, maybe the question should be what emotions don't they feel, right? Yeah. The roller coaster. Mm -hmm. I think the big, you know, point to make is that when we, when we ourselves or one of our loved ones gets an Alzheimer's or a dementia diagnosis, there's a whole grief process that mm -hmm. goes along with that, mm -hmm. right? And whether so, you see it or not, whether you recognize it or not. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And just like when we lose someone to death and the grief process that that looks like, similar to getting this big, scary diagnosis and navigating all of that, there's so many stages or, or, or emotions that go along with grief, right? There's mm -hmm. denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, wanting to, how can we, how can we make this not be, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, one of the things I just feel like is so important to reiterate to folks is you're, you're grieving. Mm -hmm. And, and the difference with, you know, grieving someone that's actually passed away, when we're grieving someone who has this dementia diagnosis, they're still in front of us, mm -hmm. right? It's just there's, different. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a complexity to the grief. And there's also this anticipatory loss of, okay, they've, they've already lost these capabilities. And so what's going to come next? It's kind of this holding our breath of waiting for the next shoe to drop. Whenever I start talking about grief and especially grief for caregivers or even grief of the person that has the diagnosis mm -hmm. too, there, I love sharing the story about there's this poem out there called welcome to Holland. Okay. And it's, it's, it's interesting. This poem, a, a old colleague, Joan Hawk, rest in peace, that I used to work with at the Alzheimer's Association. She had a son who had a developmental disability, and she's who shared this poem. And the poem is written all about being a parent to a kiddo with a developmental disability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it really applies to caring for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, too. So... 
I'll give you the quick synopsis. Everybody will have to go look at this poem. It's a beautifully written poem, but the synopsis of it is it, the poem is talking about how my whole life I've planned to go to Italy. Mm -hmm. And I've read guidebooks. I've, you know, maybe even started to study a little bit of Italian so that I know I've looked up all of the different sites and scenes that I'm going to go see. And finally, the day comes that we go to Italy and we're getting on the flight. We're ready to go. The plane lands and the flight attendant comes over and says, welcome to Holland. And so they're looking around saying, well, time out. Wait, I, I was supposed to go to Italy. Hold on. This, this isn't where I was supposed to go. Right. And the flight attendant kind of says, sorry, you're in Holland. And after kind of taking a breath and settling into the new environment and acknowledging that this isn't Italy, this isn't what I was hoping for. It's not the glitz and the glam that I was hoping for with Italy. There's still beauty in Holland, right? There's still tulips. There's still windmills. There's even Rembrandts in, in Holland. And so the whole point of the poem is, yes, there's loss. I didn't get to go to Italy, mm -hmm. but there's still beauty beauty in Holland once I get there, right? And settle mm -hmm. in. Yeah. And I think that can apply so much with the grief of caregiving and, and dealing with this diagnosis of, well, hold on a second. This isn't the retirement I pictured. Right. This isn't how I envisioned us as we age. And so there's certainly loss there, but they're absolutely, not that I'm pretending to have rose colored glasses here. There's a lot of hard too, but there can still be beauty amidst the disease journey too. So. Right. Yeah. Switching gears on that. That's so hard for a lot of families. Very difficult, especially folks that are maybe it's early onset, maybe they're in their sixties and you know, they were, they were just retiring and just getting ready to start this next season. And yeah, but they find themselves in Holland. Oh, what a great example. I love that. Isn't that yeah. fantastic? I yeah, know. absolutely. So um, what are typical symptoms for an individual mm -hmm. with a dementia diagnosis? What are you seeing? Oh, gosh. And Teresa, you know this too, right? It's like it can vary and look so different from person to person. And, you know, one of the things when I'm meeting with families is I, I start off every meeting by saying, you know, tell me a little bit about your loved one before they had Alzheimer's or vascular dementia or whatever it is, because the person doesn't just disappear, right? We right. all have certain quirks about us or personality traits or relationship dynamics. And those don't just automatically go away. Now we just have this disease that adds a complexity to it. So uh, with that being said, though, I think, you know, symptoms can vary so much from the stereotypical stuff that we hear about, like short term memory impairment, re repetitiveness, mood changes, one of the things that I feel like I, I like to reiterate is there's a whole range of symptoms that are more behavioral or mental health looking that aren't talked about as much, right? And so I feel like any moment that I get the opportunity to talk about symptoms, it's important for me to highlight, yes, we do have the repetitiveness or the forgetfulness and, and whatnot, but we also can have, you know, inability to control impulses or trouble regulating our emotions, which then can look like, you know, someone being very heightened anxiety or more easily irritable or in some situations, depending on what type of of dementia we're dealing with. I mean, we can even get to a place where there could be hallucinations or paranoia. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I bring that up not to scare people, but to also say that that can be a very typical part of the disease process. And if we know that, then we can be prepared for how do we intervene if those more mental health-like symptoms show up too. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you know, some of those symptoms are so frightening to our families. And I remember having a family call and she's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I'm like, okay, well, you're not going to believe what she did now. And I said, okay. And she said, she goes in the bathroom, she uses the bathroom. And then she takes the toilet paper squares and she lines them around the perimeter of the bathroom floor. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. well, I called the doctor and he ordered some more medicine. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, sometimes I just want to say, hit the pause button. And uh, when she leaves the bathroom, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to pick up those squares and I'm going to toss them, make two points and, and go on, you know, because right. like we don't have to be uh, just because it's different or it doesn't make sense to us in their brain. For some reason, that made all the sense in the world to her. And yeah. uh, it, she wasn't aggressive. She wasn't she wasn't, you know, fighting with anybody, but I just, uh, it's so sad for me that the families just, if some have just very little experience with any of this, they're so frightened by the unusualness, you know, cause I usually say to people, I want to help you understand why they do what they do. Yeah. Well, and especially if that was never that person, if that was someone yeah. that was always a clean freak, that mm -hmm. their bathroom was pristine. And now all of a sudden it can be incredibly jarring and scary yeah. that that's, yeah. that's not them. Right. Right. So, oh, yeah. just so hard. Yeah. I just want them to have uh, less fear, more peace as they're going through this. Um, what are our recommended non-pharmacological interventions, which I love, um, for an individual with dementia? Because yeah. the pharma we have for these folks really isn't great. And so what can, what else, what are your recommendations? Right. Which, you know, and, and I bring up the non-pharmacological because my role is social worker, right? Mm -hmm. Not not doctor, not nurse practitioner. Right. There, there are medications out there. So I think it's, it's certainly worth exploring in finding whether or not those work for you. One thing I will say about the medicine that before I actually answer your question yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is, you know, if someone is early on in the disease process, that's when those memory related medications tend to be most successful. So I do tell folks it's absolutely if you're early on or just got a diagnosis, it's worth bringing up and exploring if that's an option. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, as the disease progresses, and we're dealing with more symptoms, more of the disease, right? Mm -hmm. um, there can be a whole nother class of medications like mood stabilizing medications, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, even in some circumstances, antipsychotics. And again, not that I'm here to be like, let's everybody with dementia get on an antipsychotic. No way. Right. There's, there's legitimate risks with these medications. Right, right. But it's important to talk with your doctor, talk with your medical team, because mm -hmm. it may be that the benefits outweigh those risks. So, right. you know, you want to make the best decision for your loved one and make the most informed decision. So, and that's where things like your consultations, Teresa, or the purposeful planning program, that's why those things are there so that we can help sort through, okay, what are the risks and the benefits and how do we best advocate for ourselves with the doctor right. or within the healthcare system? So with that being said, the non-pharmacological is, you know, the biggest thing is we can't change the person with the diagnosis, right? Right. right. So what we can control is us. And so much of how we intervene is really based on changing the way we communicate. Sure, sure. And I'm sure you've talked about this loads of times on your podcast, so I won't go into all of the rigmarole of communication strategies. But what I will say is the, the quick, basic little spiel that I give to folks is the three R's, right? Is first R is your loved one will always be right. Don't argue. Don't try to use logic. Don't correct. Their reality is their reality. Mm -hmm. The second R is reassure. And that's the idea of 
really we want to start focusing more on their feelings rather than the facts of what they're saying. And similar to your example with the woman in the bathroom, instead of, you know, trying to correct and ask now, why in the world are you doing this? Let's pick yeah. this thing up. It's delicately dancing around the disease, right? Mm -hmm. And going, you know, once they're in another room, going back in when they don't see it and fixing it. Right. right. So right. sometimes, and this is where I feel like it can feel really icky but or deceitful even that sometimes our most effective intervention is withholding information mm -hmm. or even you know in some circumstances using a therapeutic fib right right so that we're really you know meeting them in their reality right so right. yeah they're always right reassure and then the third r is redirect Excellent. Right. Excellent. Yep. Excellent recommendations. I love all of that. Yeah. Cause it really is their journey and we have to figure out how to join them on it. <laughs> and so frequently in the beginning, we're like, no, no, no. I've told, why can't you, I've reminded you, why can't you remember? And it's like, okay, stop all that and take a step back. And if they would, they could. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, there, the, I will say the Alzheimer's association has a wonderful, um, flyer i'm sure they still have it that talks all about 10 ways to love your brain yep. and i think some of those are also wonderful interventions too you know i think when we go to the doctor the typical recommendation is the medications and then diet and exercise right which all of us should be doing right, right. So, right. And that's going to be the same for someone with dementia too exercise and eating a good Mediterranean style diet, all of those things are important. Right. But one of the things that I think isn't highlighted as much is the benefits of cognitive stimulation, right? And a lot of times for many of us, how we stay cognitively stimulated is through socialization. Mm -hmm. So that's where giving voice foundation is really zeroing in, right? And and trying to lift up there that giving opportunities that are safe, fun, silly, lighthearted ways to stay connected and not even realizing that you're taking care of your brain while doing that. Yeah. Cause they're moving their body. They might be coming for a meal. They're interacting with people. They're finding joy. Um, they're learning maybe something new, a new step, you know, or something, a new dance step who knows. Uh, yeah, but I, I think that's really great routine. Routine routine is so good. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's I, something called a dual tasking. Yes, which dual tasking. Yes, we just inter we just interviewed uh, Michael Gelfgott with the yes, active brain and yes, body. Yeah, exactly. Which you know, any my gosh, there's so many things that we do that involve dual tasking. But at a lot of our programs, that's that's the goal is that okay, there may be music playing while they're stomping their feet, or maybe yeah. they're clapping their hands and stomping their feet at the same time. They're doing two different tasks at the same time. And the incredible thing about our brains that I'm sure Mike Gil got talked about is that when we're dual tasking, it's essentially creating new neural pathways yes. in our brain. How cool is, is that? How cool is that? Right. right. And so, so much of our programming is incorporating dual tasking. So the hope is that, okay, yes, we're offering this socialization and helping them build a village and really basing it on science too, right? Yep. Basing it on research to make sure that okay, we are doing brain health strategies, yeah. which is funny. You would think, okay, I'm putting a vase of flowers together at Brains in Bloom. How is that helping my brain? But having to cut a stem or, you know, smelling a scent of a flower while I'm also talking to someone over here is dual tasking. It is. So. And, you know, he impressed upon me that there is quantitative evidence of this and that people do show improvement because you do all this testing with his organization and then 10 weeks or 12 weeks later they do it again after you've been doing all the stool testing uh, on all these different exercises and uh yeah 
and he's done research studies with Miami University. And so we're hearing more and more about this. So the evidence is out there. And so you guys are right on track with that. Absolutely right on track. Um, yeah. I love that. You know what, Kristen, how can my audience get more involved and support sure. the Giving Voice Foundation? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So if people are interested in learning more, obviously visiting our website is always a great first step. So our website is www.givingvoicefdn, short for foundation, .org. That's always a great you know, option there. You can see all about the different events that we have. So if someone's maybe already lost a loved one or like, you know what, my loved one's already in a facility, but I really want to give back. Um, we have information about how you can volunteer at any of these events. So we have, you know, our incredible trained facilitators that get paid to do what they do, right? But we also have folks that come to these programs to volunteer to help out too. So there's always opportunities to volunteer, there's certainly opportunities to donate if anybody ever wants to donate to a specific program. The beautiful thing about what we do is it is local. So any any money donated is staying here and helping local families. Um, if anybody is going through this and interested in a, one of the programs that we discussed, obviously, again, it's listed on our website. You, people are also more than welcome to call. Our phone number is 513-513-0483, which is 513-513-0GVF, short for Giving Voice Foundation. That's so cool and easy to remember. We're trying. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> know, where, do you see, where do you see the foundation five years from now? Oh, my gosh. Well, my hope was, you know, I started with this foundation right, right when the pandemic hit. This right. foundation was kind of birthed and coming to be. I started as a volunteer just helping rebuild some of the programs after the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And it slowly evolved into part-time program director and now has evolved into full-time program director, it, which is incredible. And not to be like, woo, toot my but to say the hope of becoming full-time program director is to be able to grow and expand the programs. Yes. I want us to continue to stay local and there's so much need here in just the tri-state area that mm -hmm. we could have a creative connections program on literally every little sub community in Anderson and Colerain and Forest Park and all that. Right. So I, my hope is we found the programs that work, the creative mm -hmm. connections, the brains in bloom, the ballroom dancing. And so now my hope is that we continue to expand and into even more locations within the community. Awesome. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful goal. And uh, yeah, I've only seen success with this organization. And I feel like, wow, amazing people have been attracted to it. And um, it is really growing. But in the times that I've been able to participate, in which I'm hoping there'll be more, um, I was- oh, <laughs> so impressed, just so impressed with how friendly, how welcoming, and then how I couldn't tell who had the diagnosis and who didn't. And I just think for people, you know, going through this, that just means so very much. And uh, so kudos to you guys. That is, that is so exciting. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Of course. Well, everybody, what can I say? Kristen Cooley, she's amazing. And she's the new <laughs> full-time program director for the Giving Voice Foundation. You need to check this out. I mean, it is, it is incredible and you need to take your loved ones there. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for tuning in. Um, check out her website. We'll definitely have it in the show notes and um, I'll, I'll get the information from the Alzheimer's Association she recommended and I'll put that in the show notes and um, just great information here. Hey, we're always trying to get better information out there for you. We hope that you'll like and share and subscribe so that we can reach even more people who are struggling, who need hope, you know, who need, who need to know that there's a village of people out there that want to help and the care enough to do this, to get more information out there. Keep in mind, everybody, you know what I believe, I believe in you, but I know you got this.